Revelation chapter 2. I, every time I keep looking at this, at this uh, church at Pergamos, something else jumps up here. There's so much here. And I told you that at the beginning, that there would be um, so much there. Like, he talks in verse 14. He's talking about the doctrine of Balaam, stum stumbling blocks, things sacrificed to idols, fornication. There's four things to deal with in that one verse. Then he mentions the Nicolaitans, verse 15. We've talked about that. Mentions repentance in verse 16. Verse 17, he's talking about giving them hidden manna and a white stone with a name written on it. What in the world is that? So all of these things here should be covered because they're questions in people's minds. What, what, is, the, what is the significance of that white stone? Why is he going to give me a white stone? What do I need with that? Well, it's important. What about that new name? What did you do? Brian, what did you do with the old name? What did we all do with it? We dragged it through the mud, didn't we? Okay. So he gives us, I mean, think of Abram, Sarai, Jacob, Saul, all of these, Jesus, all of these people in the Bible who get new names. Who gives it to them? God does for a reason. So uh, just a couple things here that are left over from verses 14 and 15. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed in the idols. And again, I mentioned that if you go read Numbers 22... In fact, you can turn there. I've got it up on the screen. And I get, didn't really get much into Balaam. If you read the story of Balaam in Numbers 22, you won't get all of what Balaam's about. If you read Revelation 2 along with it and 2 Peter 2, Jude... If you read those passages along with number 22, then you get a better picture of what Balaam did wrong. Because it sort of looks like in Numbers 22 that Balaam wasn't really doing anything wrong. But God knows the whole story. It's sort of like what was really written over the head of Jesus on the cross. Was it this is the king of the Jews or Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews? Which one? One gospel says one thing. Another gospel says another. Well, when you put all four of them together and put the words that are unique in each one, it will come out and reading it. It will come out and say, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. You get the full picture. With Peter. When you remember when they came and arrested Jesus, what did Peter do? How did he react to it? Gary, how did he, what did he do? Yeah. And he did what with it? Cut whose ear off? No. It was one of the, um, now you may, you may be right. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say, no, you're wrong, you idiot. Um, because if you read one gospel, you get part of the story that he cut off an ear. The other gospel, you find out who it was. I think it was one of the high priest's sons. Maybe wrong. But then another gospel, he's going to look it up. Fine. That's what I want you to do. The other gospel is where Jesus picks the ear up and puts it back on. You don't get that from just one place in the Bible. And it's exactly what Isaiah 28 says. It's exactly what Paul taught us, that it's uh, spiritual things with spiritual things. Here a little, there a little. Line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept. So if you're only reading part of the Bible, you're really not getting the whole picture. Keep reading. You're going to get more, trust me. You're going, you read a passage, you're going, I have no idea what this means. 
But keep reading other places in the Bible. God will fill in these gaps and things that you don't know. So Numbers 22, the, the biggest thing that I get out of the story of Balaam is that Balak thought. Balak is king. And he want, he knows the Jews are coming. And he knows what's happened already, that Moses has killed Og, king of Bashan, Sion, king of the Ammonites, I think. And these were giants. And Moses and Joshua's army has killed these giants and all these people. And that nobody's stopping them. And so he thinks now that he can hire a man to pronounce a curse on God's people. And this is, you know, if I were to ask you, can a witch cast a spell? The answer is yes. They do it all the time. Do they work? The answer is yes, they work many of the time. I won't say all the time because they don't. Can a witch or a Satanist pronounce a curse or cast a spell on a born-again Bible believer? No. You cannot be cursed and blessed at the same time. You, and as a matter of fact, as a born-again Christian, you cannot be cursed, period. Okay? Now, you have things go wrong all the time, but you cannot have someone pronounce a curse on you and the devil have that kind of power over you. God just it won't happen. I do believe that um, there are what's called spiritual assassins. Guys, people who are hired, men or women who are hired to cast spells on other people to have them killed. Yes, D. Yes, there are. He, God talked about, um, I will um, curse them even under the third and fourth generation of them who disobey me. Okay. However, when you think about that, fourth generation, and think of Calvary, the cross. Christ removes all curses. The cross removes so just because something your grandpa or your great grandfather was or did, if you are born again, that has no power over you. It doesn't. They can't curse. And here's, let me read this. Verse six, come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. This is what Balak wants Balaam to do. And he's going to give him a ton of money. And if you read this story and then know what, Jesus and Peter and Jude said about Balaam, you know that Balaam upped the ante. In other words, he made the statement, well, I wouldn't do it if you gave me half of your kingdom. Well, you know now, because of Jesus, Peter and Jude, what Balaam was doing was renegotiating the price. You won't get that from numbers, but you get it from the other three places. So, He's hiring him to curse these people. And God gets angry at him and has an angel of the Lord standing there. And that's why the donkey won't pass. And Balaam, in the, and, and it never occurs to Balaam. Here's this donkey going, why are you beating me? And Balaam never goes, but Francis, you're a mule. <laughs> yeah, never, yeah. Malchus. I knew the high priest had something to do that with that in there. And I, was, I had the name Malchus on the tip of my tongue. I just couldn't remember it enough to say it. So, but you get that from what? You get Malchus from one gospel. My point is you get Malchus from one gospel. You get Jesus put the ear on from another gospel. Okay, so read around. Um, anyway, come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, that I may drive them out of the land. Balak realizes that he cannot overcome them with spears and swords and armor and his, his army because God is on Moses' side 
And he realizes that he cannot conquer them physically, so he is going to use spirits against them. Are you paying attention now to your Bible? Does, do evil people use spirits against other people? Yes, 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 a thousand times yes. And do they try to use it against God's church? Yes, 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 a million times yes. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And some of them were turned loose on you to hurt you, to kill you, to destroy you. Satan negotiating with God to try to get to Job, to get Job to curse God and die. But Job won't do it. Satan does not understand that Job is not really worshiping God because God made him rich. Job is worshiping God because he knows it's right and he loves God. And that's why he's doing it. And so you can take everything away from him. He's still not going to curse God. He's still going to worship God. For I what he then he says, for I what that he whom thou blessest is blessed and he whom thou curses is cursed. Now that is where Balak went terribly wrong. And that didn't occur to me until I really started looking at this here a week or so ago. I never really thought about that aspect of it. I was trying to reconcile in my mind what Numbers was telling me against what I saw in Revelation and 2 Peter and so on. But then I realized they're giving you the whole and complete story in all four of those places. But in this place here, Balak honestly thought that he could curse. I mean, Gavin Newsom thought he could take the church on in California and win. Didn't he? I'll shut that. Does he care? And again, I'm not a big fan of most churches in California, but Gavin Newsom doesn't know the difference. He sees a church. He hates it automatically. And I'm going to shut them all down. I'm going to show you what power I have. And some of God's people stood up and they said, we're going to church. See ya. See you here or see you in jail, but we're going to church. And when you look at the book of Acts, when you look at Paul, when you look at Peter, you look at the disciples, you look at anybody who lived for God, you can see that you can take everything away from them and kill them. And you're not going to get them to stop worshiping Jesus. Amen. So part of that is our desire and our love for God. The other part of it is God's watching over us, protecting us and keeping us from having these curses placed on us. The elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. They came into Balaam, spake unto him the words of Balak. And again, now we could deal just for a little bit with the rewards of divination in their hand. Name a palm reader who gives out free palm readings. Name a psychic hotline that gives you the first 30 minutes for free or every hour for free. Name a, name a psychic charitable organization. The sisters of ISIS do not give out free stuff. Okay? Witches don't. Satanists don't. They don't give out anything for free. They charge everybody for everything. Okay? Or maybe just to get you hooked the first time and after that. Okay? But Babylon always has a price that you have to pay. That's, that's who they represent. Babylon. Mystery Babylon the Great. The rewards of divination. So... Um, uh, coming out with a series of Watchmen broadcast on the Catholic Church and the Eucharist. You cannot charge people for grace of God that is free. But they do. <clears throat> they still sell indulgences. They still charge families and widows for saying masses, for their dead, your poor pitiful husband is in purgatory, an invented place 
We can say some masses to get him out, but not for free. They don't do it for free. They will tap into that inheritance every single time. And I would also say, and I started seeing this in our former denomination, when the denomination magazine would come out and they're wanting all of these elder people to make sure that the denomination was in their wills. In other words, we don't care about you now, but when you die and your kids are getting a half a million dollars in whole life insurance, we want a piece of that. So they would send a guy out to your house to get you to sign a contract that put them automatically in your trust. I've been seeing that for years. They want that money. Okay? And for whatever reason, anytime you sell anything that God has given you for free. So, now, does that mean every preacher, every evangelist has starved death? No, that's what some churches think. But that's not true. Servant is worthy of his hire. But... To charge, to say, well, we can't, well, we can give you, we can give you this service here, but this afternoon we hold a special service for our partners. That's what they call them, right? Partners. For our, for our ministry partners, we have a special teaching this afternoon. Okay. That's only for our ministry partners. And if you're not, if you're, in other words, if you're not, if you haven't been throwing in the bucks, you don't get to come and you don't get the DVD. But that's commonplace now everywhere. My mom went to a Southern gospel singing. Remember that? And one of these big named national ministries was there hosting it and they did the singing a guy comes out talks about this big national ministry passes the offering plate what happened after that mom they didn't get enough so they sang some more counted up the money the guy comes out again and says you guys can do better than that hits them up again second offering same place Okay, and I'm not talking. I'm not talking about the Lutherans. I'm not talking about the Catholics. I'm not. I'm talking about mainstream, good old Baptist Pentecostal America. Okay, hitting everybody up for the big bucks, and then when they didn't pay enough in the offering, they the guy had the nerve to go out and do it again. Hit them up again. Okay, and that happens a lot. Yes. A woman. Pastor's wife. Where is Lisa? Do, do what? She hit them all up again. She had her eye on that Lincoln Continental. I guarantee you, she was wanting a Lincoln Continental or a Crown, Crown Victoria. Yeah. Six offerings. When I, when I did tours for the Prophecy Club, three offerings, and they told me how to divide the service up. And the, whoever's taking care of the service took care of the offering. The first offering was for the Prophecy Club. Second offering was to pay the local room bills, stuff like that. Third offering was for the speaker. And the last tour I did for them, I had to, I had to practically threaten them because they didn't pay me a dime for 14 cities that I went to for them. And... Uh, and it was fraud because, yeah, I didn't ask. 
And, but I waited uh, like close to 10 months. And I finally, because I knew it was fraud, and a, guy, a former speaker told me that's how he does it. You don't get your money, he gets his first. And I went, he's done it before. And then their office admitted to me that they had done it to speakers before me. There's another wasp out there. That's the second one. And so I knew it was fraud because they specifically said the third offering goes to the speaker. Well, it didn't. And it's fraud. They defrauded those people. So anyway, but that's how it's done. It's big money. And it doesn't matter if it's in the music ministries or the church ministries, the radio ministries, the internet ministries. It doesn't matter. It's big money, big bucks, book deals, speaking fees, speaking engagements. Guys will get 10 to 15 grand for a 30 minute sermonette on the speaking tour. Big name guys, 10, 15, $20,000 a pop to go speak at a church. Okay. I'm telling you big money. Another ministry calls me. We've been giving out DVDs. I know how I know what it makes to produce a DVD. So I get a call from some ministry saying that they've got all these big names selling these DVD package for families and marriage. I said, well, they said, well, hold on. We'll give you a free 30 day trial. And I said, I'm not doing that again because you're going to send me a bill. I already know how this works. I said, how much is it? They said, $750. I said, for how many discs? They said like seven. And I went, no. I said, I do this. I said, I know what it takes to package and produce a DVD. 35 to 50 cents, depending on the prices and the postage. And I said, you're not selling me anybody's nonsense for 750 bucks. I'm not buying it. I'll just teach my people out of the Bible. Good day. That's how it's done. And the rewards of divination are everywhere. And this is what Peter and Jude were both saying. Having eyes full of adultery. These are the false teachers, false prophets. Cannot cease from sin. You don't have to know what they do when they're not on camera to know what they are. The Bible's telling you what they are. They cannot cease from sin. These guys are lascivious men and women. Beguiling unstable souls. They go into poor neighborhoods. Impoverished neighborhoods. Yank people out to the big hotel meeting room. Promise them healing and financial wealth. If they will support their ministry and give large sums of money. This is how Peter Popoff does it. He got caught doing it. He got caught cheating. He got caught with everything and sprang back again like nothing happened. And he is stealing people blind. Um, cursed children. That means they're not saved. So yes, Balak and Balaam can curse these guys because they're already cursed. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. See, this is now telling you what you don't find in numbers. That he loved that money and he was chasing that money. He pretended to say, I'm only going to say what God's telling me to say. But God knew his heart and wrote it down for us in here. But was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Jude 1 11, woe unto them for they've gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. So your reward's either going to be here or it's going to be in heaven. Seek the one in heaven first. Will not God bless you down here? Sure he will. He promised he would. But seek the one in heaven first. Seek God's kingdom first, his righteousness, his ways. God will bless. Now, he said, I have a few things against thee, back in Revelation 2, back at the ranch, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, we already read that, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now, turn to... Acts 15, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because in the Watchman broadcast series, 
that's not out yet, but will be. I'm going to deal with this and show you that the Catholic Mass is in every way a violation of scriptures. A total and complete abandonment of what the gospel is all about. And totally violates the four rules that the apostles and the elders and the people who met in the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 with no pope, no chief bishop, no visible head wearing some big robe and a big crown telling them, I say it's going to be this way. They just all agreed because the Holy Ghost was in it. There was no disagreement. Once James said, let's do this, they said, good idea. We're all behind it 100%. From what I can tell, no one voted no on this thing. So in Acts chapter 15, the issue came up. Should the Gentiles be circumcised according to the law and then follow Jewish law? Do they have to follow the law to be saved? So, and there's contentions because you've got saved Jews who've been Jews all their life. They have their traditions. And they think everybody, the, well, the Gentiles are going to join with us. They have to follow our traditions. Maybe they don't want to join with you. Maybe they don't want to be part of your Jewish church. Maybe they just want to be saved and go to heaven. So there was contention at first. Uh, Paul spoke up. James spoke. Peter, who according to the Catholic Church is supposed to be the first pope. He, he's got a voice in it. But he's siding with James and Paul. But he's not saying, well, I'm the pope, so you have to do what I say anyway. He's not saying that at all. Peter's going, I, went to Cor I just came from Cornelius' house. Cornelius was the first Gentile and his family to be saved. Full, complete Gentile. No Jewish blood and heritage in him whatsoever. And Peter said, I just came from Cornelius' house. The Holy Ghost fell in that place. I preached the word. The Holy Ghost came down. Those people got saved. They began to speak in the same languages we spoke in on the day of Pentecost. It was all there. So God did not compel Cornelius to go get circumcised before he gave him the Holy Spirit. So what does that tell you? That he gives us Holy Spirit for free. What did Paul say in Galatians chapter 3? Oh, foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? And then he said, let me, hear, let me hear this from you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Which one was it? Did you, did you get circumcised? Did you fulfill a Jewish feast day and then you got the Holy Spirit? Or did you believe when Peter was preaching or Paul was preaching, when Paul said when I was preaching, did you believe what God said and accept Jesus purely on faith and then you received the Holy Ghost? And he was forcing them to say that they got the Holy Ghost Simply because they believed what Paul was preaching. They believed the word of God and God gave them his Holy Ghost for free. He gave it to them. So the Jerusalem Council came up with um, verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. We're not going to argue with the Holy Ghost. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no, he's talking to the Gentiles now, no greater burden than these necessary things. Number one, that you abstain from meats offered to idols. You're going to see in this watchman exactly how they perform what they call the sacrifice. The official title is the sacrifice of the mass. They say the Latin words and break the bread and then they and I had and I learned this they pray a prayer and it's called the Eucharistic prayer and in that prayer when the priest officially says these words that bread magically and completely turns into the very visible real body of Jesus Christ. They're holding Jesus 
in their hand, the real Jesus. And what did Jesus say? If any man say, here is Christ, believe it not. And that's what they do. They say, here is Christ, right here. He's right here in my hand. Open your mouth. And I'll give it to him. Yes. Yeah. Chip. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Paul said in Hebrews, who can bring Christ down from heaven? Nobody. But the priest, see, it goes against every scripture that we ever learned. That the priest can call Jesus, thank you for saying that, that the priest can call Jesus down from heaven to appear in this host right here and it be the very body of Jesus. They even have these stupid superstitions about how to handle this now once they've said that prayer. And guess where the prayer came from? Not here. I've read the Eucharistic prayer in two languages, Latin and English. And not a word of it came out of the Bible. They didn't get it from God. They made it up. But they ascribe to that priest the magic power of turning that wafer into Christ. And they do it in front of the giant crucifix. They sacrifice Jesus again in front of his own supposed image. And say, poof, you're dead again. This is your dead body. So number one, you're not supposed to even eat that. Go to Catholic funeral, don't do it. Don't follow that family down to take that mass, to take that wafer, don't you do it. I mean, we're told four, only four things to do. And three of them have to do with ingesting certain things. Things sacrificed to idols. Um, oh, where am I reading from? Verse 28. Verse 29. Uh, meets Alfred to idols and from blood. So now we turn to the cup. The same magic power that the priest had to turn the wafer into the body of Christ. He now has turned the wine into the literal, literal blood of Jesus Christ. And according to scripture, you are forbidden to drink that. According to scripture, and there's like a dozen, half a dozen, a dozen scriptures in the Bible that says don't eat, Start, starting in Genesis 9, before the law ever came, he said don't eat blood. Don't drink blood, don't eat blood, it's the life thereof, don't do it. So it violates the first two. Then, uh, what's the third one? From things strangled. What does crucif how does crucifixion kill somebody? Strangles them. It is the reason why they went around to break the legs of the men that were on the cross was because they were holding their weight up with their legs, as painful as it was. Jesus being nailed hands and feet. And for how many hours? He's shifting the weight from his arms to his feet, arms to his feet, arms to his feet. And what it's doing is when you're hanging out like this, it's crushing your lungs. And the point of it is it's a slow way to strangle you. It takes hours to do it. It is one of the most brutal ways to kill a man. Being burned up in a fire is quicker than crucifixion. Being shot in the stomach is I hear very painful and it takes a while to die. It's very agonizing, but crucifixion takes longer. It is a way to show people don't do this or we'll crucify you. You'll beg us to kill you after three hours on the cross. And we're not supposed to eat that because it was strangled. Okay? So what, is he, what did Jesus mean when he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood? It's the word. 
Man shall not live by, but by every word of God. Okay? So I'll be presenting that in detail to show you that the sacrifice of the mass is a grotesque violation and the pathetic things that they do and believe about that wafer once that prayer has been said and the sadistic thing that an Australian Archbishop George Pell did after celebrating the mass. And I'm going to tell it. I just haven't recorded it yet. I'm getting there. Let's pray. Uh, next week, we'll get into the white stone, hidden manna, and the new name. Father, this word, this Bible's right. This Bible is right. I love it. I need it. I need it more now than I ever have. I'm not getting less dependent on the Bible. I'm getting more dependent on it. And I thank you, God, that it's here. That my salvation is in this book. It's not in some church somewhere. It's not in some wafer. It's not in the form of a magic spell. It is in the word of God. I'm born again by the word of God. Father, bless this word. Bless these people. Deal with us in our hearts. Show us the right way. Because the evil day is approaching. And the strong delusion is coming. And many people are going to fall for it. Bless your word today. The hearts of these people. We ask in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen.